Yeah, brave new worlds with Wine Electric. And we have the uh, senior vice president, did I get that right? And the chief operating officer of Hawaiian Electric, Jim Alberts. Thank you so much for joining us, Jim. Yeah, it's great to be here, Jay. It's been a while, so thanks for having me back. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh, let's try to catch up. Um, the first thing is, you know, it was about a year ago, and Scott's you went to HEI, and um, and um, Shelley Kimura became the the CEO of Hawaiian Electric. Uh, and uh, was that when you became uh, the senior vice president and um, uh, and uh, chief operating officer too? It was as part of a overall transition for the whole company, and it turned out to be a really great transition with all the continuity we had inside the company. So I think it worked out really well that Scott got to be the CEO at, at HEI and Shelly got promoted to be the CEO of Hawaiian Electric. So a lot of strong continuity. We all got to work together on our strategic plan uh, that we had implemented right before uh, this transition. So it worked out really well. I mean, the people are connected and the thought process is connected at the same time. Then all this in in the face of COVID, uh, and gee whiz, all the you know the fallout may I say from COVID, and in terms of recruiting and employment, uh, um, and and the change of office, um, you know, office systems and the like. Uh, how has that been for you for Hawaiian Electric? Yeah, most of our a lot of our workforce has been working from home over the past two years. Now, much of our workforce in the operations area has been working just as they always have, because they have to show up on site to do their jobs. But for everybody else, we're gonna start uh, coming back slightly in a hybrid work environment in September and test that process out. And, and part of that, as you mentioned, Jay, is moving into a new building at the same time. So we're combining, consolidating square footage in downtown to uh, reduce our, our rents and get everybody into one building. So Everybody's been busy meeting with their teams, trying to in, indoctrinate them on coming back to work, at least part of the time. And then we'll take it from there once we get through the hybrid process. Yeah, these are interesting times, honestly. Um, the new building, which is the new building and what is happening to the old building? Well, it's the, uh, the Elite Tower uh, right there on Alakea Street. So it's just up the street from where we're at in the ASB tower now, at least mm -hmm. many of us. There's a bunch of people in the Central Pacific Bank Tower as well. So this was an opportunity for us to just consolidate and get everybody together. Great idea. What are you going to do with the old one? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a um, it's a historic building for sure. Right. Well, uh, we don't own that. Surprisingly, people don't know we don't own that building. Kamehameha Schools owns the building. So when we moved out, they took that building back and they're working on its next life. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I hope they preserve it from a, an historical point of view because it really is deeply embedded in the history of Hawaii. And I'll never forget there's a little doorway um, on the King Street side where you can line up and pay your electric bill. <laughs> and, and, you know, through, you know, decades, through millennia, People have lined up at that little doorway to pay physically, personally pay their electric bill, right? <laughs> they have. And I, you know, that's where I started when I worked, came to work for Hawaiian Electric 10 years ago. Uh, it's a very historic building. It's got a lot of nice uh, charisma to it. So a beautiful old building, part of the history. I, I hope it gets to be utilized going forward. But now, you know, speaking of payments, so many people now today pay online or remotely. You know, there aren't nearly as many people that want to walk in to pay anymore. There are still a few, and we have, a, have options for people to do that. But those numbers are down a lot compared to what they used to be. Yeah, speaking of payment, I recall that uh, early on in COVID, you know, there were, there were problems. People were losing their jobs. They didn't have the same kind of income. They weren't able to pay the electric bill. You guys uh, gave them a break. You gave them installment payments or deferral. Um, and, and I guess that was, you know, part of the, what do you call it, the utility community doing that. Um, but uh, where are you on that now? Did you, were you able to recover? Was Hawaiian Electric able to catch up on what people owed to it for electrical service? Uh, and what are you doing about that now? 
you know, we're, we're still working with people that are behind, um, you know, really don't want to disconnect service, but we have started that process up again. So the process we, we go through, and this is, this has been in place for a long time. We would, uh, contact people, let them know and try and line them up with other agencies, whether it's third party assistance, uh, federal assistance, any kind of assistance to make sure that they get the help they need to pay their bills. And then if that doesn't work out, uh, put them on a payment plan and make sure that we help keep their lights on because we know that that does have an impact on families and lifestyles. So that's our ultimate goal is to help get the bill paid, but keep the lights on. Yeah. And small businesses, the yes. same kind of thing. Yes. Very you good. know, I mean, all this makes me, it reminds me of uh, something that I was thinking uh, a few years ago, and I mentioned it on our show, is I, I think Hawaiian Electric ought to um, you know, change its name uh, to Hawaii's Electric Company. Hawaii's Electric Company, because it is so deeply embedded in the history of Hawaii. It goes back to 1910 or so, and, uh, it, you know, it has, uh, it, has, it has made the state what the state is. It has come through all these periods of history. Uh, but, you know, it, that, that didn't catch on, though. You haven't, I noticed you have not changed your name to that yet. <laughs> no, we haven't. But we have been busy in, you know, what we call our one company process, trying to move toward the consolidated Hawaiian electric team across all the islands. So in a lot of cases, you'll see, you know, in the press, you'll see us calling ourselves Hawaiian electric instead of Hawaiian electric, Maui electric, Hawaii electric light. Uh, just to try and get everybody used to making that step uh, that we are Hawaiian Electric. No, I think that's great. I mean, this is this is a uh, what's it, it's um, we are, we are one state, and we should not see the islands as different. You know, for a time there were people who said, "Oh, every island has its own personality and you know its own character, and we have to keep them different." Well, I don't know if that really works. We are one state, and we will always do better when we see it that way. So I'm glad you're doing that, actually. Um, okay, the other thing that's come up, and we would be remiss if we didn't mention it, is that in a, in a few days, ooh, uh, gee whiz, in, in a few days, we're going to be out of coal. No more coal. NMC, no more coal. <laughs> By virtue of, <laughs> of a statute already, a, a statute that says that. Um, so, uh, you know, we've talked to other people uh, like Jim Kelly, from Hawaiian Electric about this. And I wonder your take, how do you feel about it? What are the challenges uh, for the company? What are the challenges for you uh, as senior vice president and chief operating officer to make sure there's no gap, there's no blackout or brownout, what have you? Right, so the good news is we've been planning for this for a while. We knew even before the law was passed that <clears throat> this contract with AES was gonna expire and there would be a chance that it wouldn't be continued. So we've been planning for this for a long time, which also includes uh, a lot of the RFP processes for the renewable projects that are in flight. Now, if anybody's ever interested, then go to our website on the Hawaiian Electric Renewable uh, Status Board and see the status of all the projects. Uh, there are a bunch out there, right? So the process is to bring these projects on as a replacement for that AES coal plant. Now, the goal at the end of the day is, is to create stability and, you know, energy security here in the state for Hawaii. So we want to see stable bills, not all this crazy volatility that happens with oil prices, but that's going to happen with time. Yeah, well, I, I think we all have to um, be sympathetic. I, 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 um, I, I imagine that when we get to the end of COVID, I don't want to use the word normal because I don't think normal fits anymore, but um, when we get back to some some degree of norm normality, normalcy, um, the, some of these projects are going to go like a coiled spring. Um, you know, they've been, they've been held back, but uh, when we get to normalcy, uh, tell me if I'm right, when we get to normalcy, they're going to they're gonna charge ahead and we're going to have a lot of projects that have been in the pipeline getting realized. Am I right? Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful for that same view, Jay. Uh, we've got a couple developers that are have multiple projects. So the first time through in the second project, now they're using the same or very similar equipment. So that should speed up a lot of the testing, the permitting, all the processing 
because it's not new anymore at that point. It's just another one of the same thing. So I'm very optimistic that that process can move quicker and more timely. Now, I do think this is one of the big issues for the state that it has to tackle and wrestle with is how do we get aligned around what that end state looks like? Because there's a lot of ways that these projects uh, can take on different turns. And, you know, we just have to stay focused on these, not just us, but, you know, the state uh, agencies, and the federal agencies, and our local counties and cities helping get these projects through the process. And the more we stay focused on that as the outcome, uh, the better off we are. So what is the um, uh, tax reduction tax reduction uh, bill from Joe Biden? How does that affect utilities in general? And how does it affect uh, Hawaiian Electric uh, in terms of development of renewables uh, and any, uh, any other effect you may see coming down the pike? Yeah, we think it creates some significant opportunity for all utilities, really. For us, you know, we're excited about it because it can create some new uh, tax credit benefits. It can share those kind of benefits uh, across the whole value chain, not just with us, but everybody who's doing a project. So, you know, we saw what the tax credits and the tax benefits did for, for rooftop solar in the first couple of rounds when when prices were high, right? You remember those days, don't you, Jay? Uh, yeah, I haven't forgotten them yet. <laughs> so, you know, if we get the process worked out and the tax credits come through, uh, all those things are enablers for a brighter renewable future. So we're very optimistic. In, in the same vein for electrification, you know, we think there's some big opportunities there for things like charging infrastructure. You know, one thing that's really odd is that that this inflation reduction bill is intended to reduce inflation. And in fact, the, the president, you know, or the administration has had some effect on reducing gas prices at the pump. And I'm saying, you know, that was one great incentive to go electric. And now the price of gas is going down. Um, I mean, I, are you losing your the power of your built-in incentive, Jim? No, I think, you know, once once we get past just to focus on renewables and we get everybody looking at decarbonization as the long term end game, which is where we have to go if we really want to have an impact on the planet is to decarbonize, which means we need everybody to get an electric vehicle at some point. Now, I drive an electric vehicle. I don't miss stopping at the gas station at all. You know, I've been driving one for three years now and throughout the whole pandemic. You know, it's just a seamless process from a safety and a cost standpoint. Yeah. The other thing that, that just strikes me, and I don't know exactly what the current status of it is, but for a time there during COVID, uh, we were having trouble with, with the supply of chips. And chips are, are going to be involved in, in the, um, you know, the newer technologies for renewables, for solar, especially inverters and the like. Um, and if we can't get the chips, we have to, you know, I don't know what we do. Um, but is, is that having an effect on uh, the ability of your developers to do these, um, you know, cutting edge projects? Well, the, the chipsets are really affecting everything, not just us, but, you know, you read about it in the papers, uh, automobiles, mm. everything that requires computer technology is being affected by this. So uh, the developers are working hard to line up their supplies. Uh, far in advance so that they won't be set back by this, just like we are. But we also are realists. We know that those kind of things can change pretty quickly. So we have to make sure we always have contingencies and options available to us. You know, I always said that the transformation of Hawaii's energy um, landscape costs money because you have to put money into infrastructure. If you use the old infrastructure, then it doesn't cost you as much as buying and installing, um, you know, learning about em employing, deploying, uh, you know, new technology. Um, and here we are, uh, you know, in the September 1st cold deadline and so forth. And you guys came out with a, um, you know, a, a press release a couple of weeks ago indicating that prices would go up. And I know that's, that's a very uh, important point for you because 
Uh, you've been, you know, uh, in charge of customer customer satisfaction uh, for many years in your stint at the Hawaiian Electric. So, can you talk about the price increases? Um, what makes the price go up, and what what can you do about it going forward? Yeah, the big driver, Jay, is the oil prices, and we've seen over a long history the volatility of oil and the impact that can happen and that it can have on the economy. So this is the time to just, in my opinion, to just stay the course, uh, keep investing in these renewable projects because these renewable projects will sign, will have 20 year fixed term pricing in them. We won't be, we won't see that volatility. They're not tied to an index. It's just fixed pricing. Now that's a great thing. Uh, because it allows people to plan and budget more effectively. And that's the end goal for the state, uh, to really help the business environment and each homeowner be able to put their budget together. And, you know, a couple of things I might add to this. Uh, you know, one is a partnership with uh, Hawaii Energy. And being able to think about energy efficiency is kind of our first step to use less energy. Because as we look forward to electrification, we're going to have to make sure we're as efficient as we can be. And when I look from an operation standpoint, the way our, our load curve works today, which you've seen us talk about, you know, it ramps up in the morning and then it drops in the day when solar comes on, and then it has to ramp up really fast in the evening. So getting storage on, like the KES battery energy storage system, uh, in early to mid 2023 is going to be a huge help for us. So all those technologies, including uh, the batteries, battery storage, the renewables, and energy efficiency all have to play a part in that process to help stabilize those costs and drive them down. But it's the oil prices that are doing it now. We want to get off oil. So where does the, uh, that, that very high-tech plant you have in Kapolei that one runs on um, uh, LNG, um, the, the ramp, I forget the name for it, the, 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 the peaking plant, the peaking plant. Where does that fit in this picture? Well, we don't have anything that runs on LNG. Everything today runs on oil, uh, just different, iterate, different kinds of oil. Mm. So the, the uh, CIP Campbell Industrial Park unit that we have uh, is one of those peaking units. Now, the nice thing about that, it starts and ramps up very quickly, which is what we need in the future. If you think about some of our old power plants we have today, they're just not designed to operate in this environment where things have to come on and off. They were designed for a day when you, know, you would turn them on and you just leave them on at a certain level. And they're very efficient at that. So part of this grid modernization plan and power plant modernization plan is to slowly phase those old plants out and add new uh, firm generation that can enable more renewables to be installed on the grid. That's the goal. Yeah. Um, okay, you talk about uh, grid equity just for a moment. And one, one of the things that strikes me about grid equity is that if you, if you incentivize uh, single family residences, um, you're, you know, you're incentivizing just the people who have the buck because they're the ones who got to spend tax credit or not. They're going to have to spend the money. Um, but if you do a utility operated uh, solar farm and a utility operated, uh, you know, battery facility, that that benefits everyone. And to me, I mean, maybe I'm, you know, uh, old fashioned in my view here, but to me, that's equity. Because, because everybody has the benefit of that rather than a few people you know, with a big bankroll. Uh, are you moving in that direction? Are you, how are you trying to achieve or achieving grid equity? Right, well, that's a great question, Jay. So the, the first push of renewables, you're right, was all rooftop solar for single family homes. So that benefits a, a more limited group of people that have access to money to invest in their homes. <laughs> Now, lately, we've been super busy, focused on these utility scale projects. <clears throat> and these projects are going to benefit everybody. So again, if you go to that, if anybody wants to look at it, go to our project status board on our website. And you'll What's see the that. name of your website? It's hawaiianelectric.com. 
And if okay. you just click on the tab that's on the front page there, that talks about the uh, Hawaiian Electric Renewable Project Status Board. Click on that tab and it'll take you right to the status board. It'll show you the list of all the projects we're working on, when they're expected to come online. And there's a lot of them. So I think we, as, as a state and a community, we should be uh, excited about all of these projects coming online at some point. Mm -hmm. and, and setting aside a lot of these oil-based operations to incorporate more renewables. Yeah, it's really, it's really an exciting time for the whole industry to think about bringing more renewables onto the system and providing uh, stable pricing and energy security for the state. Yeah, is that your drift? Is that your priority um, to do this on a community-based solar and on a utility-scale solar, utility-scale battery facility? I mean, is that where we're going here? Is that your preference? I don't know if it's a preference, but there has to be balance. So when I talk, when I think about a balanced system, there's room for utility scale systems like the big ones that we're doing with all our IPP development partners and the batteries. But we also want customers to have their own option. So if they want to continue to put on uh, rooftop solar, we have another new program called the Battery Bonus Program. If somebody wants to install a battery, even on an existing net energy metering contract, they can. And through technology, give us access to that battery. So in those evening peak hours, that one hour every night, we have a peak. Uh, we can access those batteries to help shave that peak for the whole system. So in a sense, people that are investing in those systems are giving benefit back to the greater good, in addition to all those big utility scale projects that are being worked on. You know, the, the sort of the confluence of the development of these things and the date in your press release where you indicate that you think the prices are going to be a little higher than before through um, uh, sometime in 2024. Uh, can you talk to me about how that line, how you predict that line will go and what will happen at and after 2024 in terms of uh, the expense to consumers? Well, it's just, I'll just I'll give it to you in my terms. Uh, so the way I think about it is those prices over time uh, will still be volatile because of oil, because many of these projects, when you look at the timelines on them, that's about the time frame they're starting to come on. So these fixed price contracts will start to have an effect uh, after 2024 when they all come online. Now that's the, for me, that's probably the most important thing we can't lose sight on is how do we keep driving projects to completion on each island to stabilize pricing and provide that energy security for the state and for each island. Because if we, if we can accomplish that, we provide a lot of stability, that does a lot of great things for the whole state. Yeah, you talk about each island, gee, I, uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the day when uh, interconnection was all, was all the rage. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I thought, oh, it's coming, it's coming. I don't think it's coming anymore, uh, but I'd like to see it because, you know, as we discussed earlier, this is one state uh, and right. uh, the more we can connect the islands, the better. And maybe just maybe the technology going forward, um, you know, especially in the channel between Maui and the Big Island where it's very deep in that channel, um, maybe the technology would, would allow for that easier, deeper in the future than it was, uh, you know, when we considered the possibility before. I'm assuming for a moment, uh, Jim, that the technology would allow that, you know, easier, cheaper. Um, would it be beneficial, you think, to reconsider the notion of interconnection between the islands? Yeah, may maybe someday. But I think the technology to deploy things locally is probably going to outpace that. So I'll give you an example. Now, this is futuristic, but say the Big Island has excess uh, renewable capacity and it's now cost effective to electrolyze hydrogen. That hydrogen could be shipped to the other islands without having to have an inter-island cable. And now that looks like bulk storage. So those kind of things that are renewable oriented that create new industries here in Hawaii are extremely beneficial because it helps keep the dollars here also, creates that circular economy. 
Yeah, that would be great. And, and there was discussion about that at, in the context of uh, Pune Geothermal Venture uh, a couple, three years ago. And HENEI was working on it to try to figure out a system to generate hydrogen out of the geothermal and then ship those tanks everywhere. Of course, you've got to have a receiving end also that can actually burn the hydrogen and make the power. Um, now, one thing, that, I might, one thing I might add here just real quick, Jay, is, you know, diversity on an island is, is critical. So, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine late last week and they had a power crunch in their area and they have the luxury of being able to go out and buy power on the bulk power system if something happens. We don't have that luxury. So from a risk perspective, making sure we've got great diversification from generating resources all the way to the grid itself has multiple paths to get to a home and in a resilient way, it's, it's all that diversity, the technology, the timing of it. Just don't put everything into one technology and in one time frame to help manage the risk. And if we do that right, we create a really sustainable economy over the long period of time to create more jobs here. So you get all this diversity, it creates a lot of pocket industries for people to participate. Yeah, amen to that. Um, so, you know, energy is, um, it's an industry. It is. And it should be an industry that includes a lot of different players and companies and, and technologies and so forth. Which, which reminds me, it was only, uh, what, a day or two ago that I saw a piece about PGV and they had an a open meeting on the big island and they want to raise their production to, I want to say, 60 megawatts uh, from something over 40. Um, what, what is happening with that? Where does that fit in the bigger picture? Well, we've got to get them first to get their output to the contracted amount they have now. And if there is the potential for increasing capacity, uh, we would negotiate that to benefit customers. If it's not a good price, then we'll, we would have to see where that goes. But, you know, in the long run, for an existing project to create more capacity, that would be pretty efficient. So they should be able to offer some pretty lucrative pricing to us. Yeah, their old contract was way too high, as I recall. And this is an, op this is an inflection point for you uh, to bring that price down. Uh, it is. Because yeah. if you think about the old, the old, old days when renewables first started coming on, people didn't know how to price them. So they were indexed to, you know, or avoid a cost of energy. Now the new projects are all just based on a competitive market cost and then it's flat for the period of the contract. So the new contracting process that was created by the company is, is proving out to be ben very beneficial for customers. Well, that's important. Um, I don't know what the, um, the current thinking of um, Leo and the new, the new chair of the PUC is on that, uh, but I know that in the past, the PUC has been very interested in holding, holding prices down. Um, and, I, and I wonder your thoughts. We have, we have a new, effectively a new PUC. We, we have a new member. Uh, Naomi, and, and then we have Leo as the chair, and all of a sudden it's musical, musical chairs. <laughs> how, does, how does that affect all of this? Well, I, I really look forward to it, and I think that back to one of my earlier comments I gave is the more alignment we have around kind of a common outcome, the better off we're going to be, because time is, is of the essence. You know, 2045 doesn't move anymore. We've set that end date. So we've got to start actively thinking about what projects need to drop in when in order to achieve that goal. And then it comes down to execution risk. I don't want us, I, don't, I would hate for the state and all of us to be in a position where we got to make it happen in the last five years because we haven't been able to agree on something yet. So getting that alignment so we can start moving and doing it incrementally, to me, it's like dollar cost averaging in a retirement plan. You know, it may never be the perfect time, but over time, it's a good plan. So we just have to keep working on it. You know, I keep thinking about wind, you know, like when we, we first started, when you and I first met, you know, you know, first wind was there in Maui. We were all so proud of them for going up on the hillside. And, uh, and I, I, I went there a couple of times and reported on it and everything. Um, now you don't hear too much. Uh, Ulapalakua has a wind farm that's impressive and some of the North Shore Although on the North Shore, there's been, what do you want to call it, NIMBY effect. Um, but I wonder what you think about the future of wind, and especially, and I haven't heard much, much about it lately, 
maybe there have been developments or resistance to developments I'm not aware of. But uh, what do you think about um, uh, ocean wind, you know, offshore wind, uh, as they have, you know, all over the North Sea in Europe? Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic on that too. There, are, I know there are quite a few people looking at it here in Hawaii on what the right locations are, what the right sites are. Wind has a really good uh, profile to it. You know, it can run 24 hours a day. So I think it really helps the system. If we can find a way to get it in, that we can get aligned around as a state and just move on and get it done, then that starts to fill in those big blocks. You know, if you can get a 400 megawatt offshore wind farm. And now that takes care of a big chunk of what we're after. And you can start to work on other parts that you need to fit into that puzzle. So it's piece by piece. We just keep working at it. But I, I, I really am optimistic for wind. Good. I'm, I'm happy to hear that because I like wind. I, I, I believe it's poetic. That's just me now. I, I like the sound of those blades. Uh, I like to hear the engagement of the of the turbine against the, the environment. It's just wonderful. Um, it's musical too. But, you know, I wanted to ask, you know, this all sort of uh, raises the question of big wind, really, really big wind, uh, extreme weather wind, which, you know, the scientists tell us, including scientists right here in Hawaii, they tell us it's just a matter of time before we have extreme weather. Um, and of course, um, you know, one, one of the things extreme weather does is it brings, it brings the grid down. Uh, I recall uh, we did a show about Puerto Rico. Uh, after, you know, the big storm in Puerto Rico, they looked at one uh, solar farm, which had a certain kind of connector on it, and uh, another solar farm, which had a different kind of connector on it. And the one solar farm with the, with the I guess, the better connector, nothing moved. The other farm came apart, and it was over. Um, and, you know, so th there are important choices to be made. Um, to be resilient um, against that kind of weather. Um, how much are you worried about that? How much should I be worried about that? Well, we think about it all the time, Jay. So the, I know our contracting team and engineering team have put standards into our contracts. So when we go to implement those, they have to exceed a certain wind rating from a design perspective. And then we go through the inspection process. So there's a lot of checks and balances in that process to make sure that it gives it the best chance of survival in the event we do get a, a hurricane. So here we are, we are at an inflection point. Um, just uh, summarizing some of the things you and I have talked about. We talked about changing um, the management arrangement uh, at Hawaiian Electric and HEI. Uh, we've talked about um, you know, the, uh, the COVID effect. We've talked about um, new technology and geopolitical issues around Fuel and technology. We've we've talked about um, you know the new the new configuration of the PUC. Um, gee whiz, uh, we've talked about a lot. I'm sure I missed two or three things in there. Um, but my my question is, what what would you leave with our audience about where we are on this inflection point and where we're going and how they should feel? Um, you know, because we're we're going to be in a different place. I don't know how different it's going to be or in what ways, but you probably do. And I wonder if you could tell us how it's going to be different um, and what we should expect going forward. Well, I, this is an inflection point, Jay. I think, you know, as we look around, we see the impact of what's happening with the world energy markets on everybody in Hawaii. So we have to pay close attention to that. And we know that what's happening to people today is not sustainable. So what I would encourage everybody to do is, is, you know, work with us, the whole community on how we can move as quickly as we can to this decarbonized future. And that's the one way in the long run to really get to firm, stable pricing and energy security for the state. Can you imagine a day where we don't have to import anything and we're self-sustaining here in Hawaii and we've created our own energy industry, self-sustaining industry here in Hawaii that provides a lot of uh, good paying jobs. So for me, that's, that's a ways out there. In the near term, we really have to pay attention to what's happening locally with our economy and help out however we can. Yeah, uh, and by the way, you guys, he's not only talking to you, he's talking to government, 
uh, with a new governor coming soon um, and lieutenant governor. He's talking to the legislature, which will have a lot of new people and appointments within the committees. Uh, he's talking to the rest of the industry, the entrepreneurs here and from the mainland who would come and participate in our new chapter of energy here in Hawaii. So it's everybody. Thank you, Jim. Jim Alberts, the uh, Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Hawaiian Electric, Hawaii's electric company. Thank you, Jay. Good to see you again. Same here. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.